Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. This is the first Sunday of, of the Lenten season. It's preparation for coming up to Easter. And this is traditionally read during this time. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, and he stood him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give His angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I, will, I give to you, if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, prepare our eyes, prepare our ears, prepare our hearts to receive you. And thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. When I was in college, <clears throat> I was listening to a sermon. The minister was talking about temptation. And I was listening along as best I could. But then he said his big t biggest temptation. Now, when he opened it up, he said, the thing that I have more trouble with than anything else, I'm thinking, you know, he's going to air his dirty laundry. Well, everybody start. you know, I started leaning in when he's, you know, if the preacher's going to start airing their dirty laundry, he's, and, and he started building it up. He said, you know, my greatest temptation, the thing that I struggle with more than anything else, the biggest problem that I have, and then came the reveal, he said, is impatience. And I thought, that's the worst you got? Well, there's no hope for me. You know, if he had said, you know, I have trouble with murder. Everywhere I go, I leave a dead body. Then I thought there's a little wiggle room for me. You know, there's hope for me. But he said, impatience. <laughs> but people just don't like to air their dirty laundry. We live in a culture where we talk about total transparency. 
curious thing is, we also talk about too much information. We live somewhere between total transparency and too much information, and the truth is no one likes to air their dirty laundry. But that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. I mean, that's, that's the only way we would know about the temptation, is if Jesus shared it. It's not like there's this, this little scribe sitting on a rock over in the corner, and he says, and, the, and Jesus said, and, and he looks over, and he writes, and, and the devil said, how do you spell pinnacle? And then he, he started, no. The only way we know that it's here at all is because Jesus shared his temptation. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in the Gospel of Luke. It's right at the beginning of all three of, of those Gospels, so, so you and I would know it. And in the book of Hebrews, it was a book written to teach teachers how to, to share the basics of the faith. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, for since Jesus, he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. At the beginning of a, 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 an instruction book is about Jesus' temptation. The beginning of the, Matthew, Mark, and Luke is Jesus' temptation. We might not want to believe or feel comfortable that Jesus was really tempted, but it's important for the gospel. It was important for the early church, and it's important for you and me to know that he's been in your shoes. He's lived in your house. He knows what it's like to be tempted. And so we read this morning the temptations of Jesus. And even as I say, he knows what it's like, I, I start to try and enter into what it says here, and I'm starting to think, you know, he, he was tempted to change the stones into bread. And I think about all the times that I was tempted to go out in the backyard and pick up a rock and say, pumpernickel. I, I never. And the, the whole thing about throwing himself off the pinnacle of the temple, I, I don't even like getting on the roof of my house. So that, the temptation, I, I'm zero for two. There's no temptation. Now this third one, being king of the world. Now it might come as a surprise to a lot of folks. I, sometimes a whole week goes by that I don't think about being king of the world. I mean, I, the thought of that, it, you know, we see pictures of presidents at the end of their term and they very often show a before and an after picture and presidents just, and that's just one country. They look so haggard and worn out, worn down from from trying to, to govern one country. Imagine the whole world. Well, you know, I, that just sounds like a lot of stress, a lot of work, a lot of problems. You know, I, that's just, I've never been tempted to rule the world. So what in the world does this have to say to us? Well, I think it's important for us to realize this is, before Jesus has healed the first person, it's before he's called the first disciple, it's before he's preached the first sermon, that Jesus is still wet from his baptism, and it's the voice of God still ringing in his ears, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. That he has the approval of God the Father, the testimony of God the Father, and still in his ears, and that's when temptation comes. It's not when he's been defeated. It's not when there's been this, this long series of trials. It's, it's, it's at, at the peak. He goes into the desert, and it's there that after 40 days, He's tempted, tempted by the devil. And the question is, how will my life count? How will my life count? Will I be about good bread or the good news? How will my life count? Will I be about a good show there at, at the temple 
or will I be about good news? How will my life count? Will I be about getting mine or giving to God? Now I think this strikes a little closer to home. A little closer to home. And the very first temptation that comes to us, and how will my life count is, will I be good without God? Good without God. I think that's a temptation for all of us. Because we look at this temptation and Jesus is tempted to change stones into bread. Well, what's so bad about that? As a matter of fact, that's a very good thing. Imagine that everywhere Jesus went, if he fed everyone for always, if he did away with hunger, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. And the greatest temptations in our lives are not to, hey, let's go be bad. The greatest temptations in our lives are to be good, to be good without God. You remember the temptation for Adam and Eve. They saw that the fruit was good for food, desirable to the eyes. The temptation in eating the fruit wasn't, let's go be bad. It was good for food, but it wasn't what God wanted. God's desire was to walk with them every day in the cool of the day. That they would grow into a deep and an intimate relationship with God by getting to know God, to getting to know his heart. And not just good and evil. That it's a relationship that, that God desires. And to be good, to be good. I like the way that C.S. Lewis related this exact, exact point. He said that the real demons in our lives come not from fallen rats or fleas. In other words, the, the very worst things in the world that, that, that obviously shows up as, as evil rats and fleas. That the, the demons in our lives come not from fallen rats or fleas, but from fallen angels. That it's whatever's best, it's whatever's highest, it's whatever's good and most noble, elevated above God. That's where evil comes from. That's where the real evil comes from. That we can even give a divine authority to something as good as love. We have the compa capacity to give divine authority to, to love elevated above God. In World War II Germany, elevated love of country, love of the fatherland in a way to justify killing six million Jews and over 70 million people during World War II. That it's what's good, it's what's highest. It's those angels in our lives that become the demons. And we can look at it in history as World War II Germany, but you know, even closer to home, when we give divine authority to love, it becomes jealousy. It becomes justification for jealousy, and it becomes justification for betrayal. And maybe even a little closer to home than that, it becomes justification for spoiling our children. I just love them so much that it spoil them. That we hurt them by loving them too much. Because it's elevated above God's desires. I'd like to, to draw our attention to that this is an election year. And People have an at a tendency, especially in election year, to take what's good in the Democratic Party, to take what's good in the Republican Party, and elevate them so highly that they're used to divide friendships and family, to push and to separate people from each other, to take what's good and give it divine authority to elevate it above God. That it wasn't just a temptation 
for Jesus is a temptation for you and for me to try and be good without God, to take what's good, what's highest, what's best, and elevate it above God. It's not just a temptation for Jesus. I, I believe it's a temptation for you and me as well. But that's not all. The second temptation, Jesus was, was tempted to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And I said uh, uh, at, uh, in, during my introduction, you know, I don't like getting on a ladder, much less thinking about jumping off the roof being a good thing. And it's just not a temptation of mine. It might be for you and good for you if it is. But you might want to talk to somebody if that is a temptation. But for Jesus, we need to know that this is the pinnacle of the temple. It's not just a high place. It's the pinnacle of the temple. There'd be thousands to see him do it. There'd be thousands to see the angels as, as the way the devil put it, that to stretch out their hands so he wouldn't strike his foot against a stone. That he would have the approval, the applause of everyone around. And doesn't that feel good? To win the appro app approval and the applause of those around us. That's a, a definite temptation. Dunbar High School for a long time and in Texas was known for its great basketball teams. Well, I read a, a story on the internet that talked about, well, now it's not just known for its great basketball teams in the past, but for its interscholastic calculator team. That it turns out that they were a part of a calculator contest of all the high schools in Texas. And the way that the contest went was teams would bring their, their best students and the judges would give 80 questions, 30 minutes to answer those 80 questions and whichever team had the most correct calculations would be the, the team that won and whichever individual got the best calculations would, would be the, the state champion there as well. Well, it turned out at the end of the 30 minutes that Dunbar High School, the judges awarded them to have the most correct answers. There was going to be some transition in, in the gymnasium, and so they were going to change and set it up for the awarding ceremony. And that's when one of the team members on Dunbar High School began to calculate the judge's score. The, the judges said that Dunbar High School won, and he calculated the judge's score, and an ironic thing happened. In a calculating contest, the judges calculated incorrectly that Dunbar High School was really second. So he went to his coach and, and told his coach. His coach went to the judges, took the calculations and said, you all calculated incorrectly. We're second place and not first. And it was after the awards ceremony that a journalist went to the, that young student and said, why'd you do it? No one would have known. And this is what the student said. He said, 20 years from now, I would have looked at that gold medal and felt guilty because I would know we didn't really win. Reporting it was the right thing to do. I had to do it because I have to live with myself. And I wanted to be able to look at myself in the mirror and not feel ashamed. We definitely live in a culture that loves the applause, loves the approval. The approval of mom and dad long after we've left home. The approval of husbands, wives, sons, daughters. The approval of friends. So much so that much of digital media is about the approval, the likes, of friends. It's something that, that's deep within us. Jesus rose from the grave to give power that you and I don't have. Not just to seek approval of friends, but the approval of God. His will is what it's called. To seek His will, His wants. 
and to be able to look in the mirror. Not seeking a, the applause, but integrity. His standard, his pleasure. It's not just a temptation for, for Jesus, it's a temptation for you and for me to seek approval without the integrity, the approval without God. The last temptation that I wanna address this morning is that third temptation. That the devil took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and told him, so all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Well, Jesus didn't talk long about that when he just said, be gone, Satan. You will show worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There was no other discussion about that. And in looking at this temptation, when the devil takes him to the highest mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and says, all these things I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. We have to stop for a second and listen to what scripture says. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That the nature of evil is to lie. That the devil was gonna try and give Jesus something that didn't belong to him in the first place. That the nature of evil is to lie. And the nature of evil is a lie that says we receive by getting, we receive by gaining, we receive by grabbing, we receive by taking what don't I deserve, what should be mine, by longing for what I want. And when the Apostle Paul begins to talk about the, the, the allure of sin, in Romans chapter 7, he, he starts with coveting. Coveting. He doesn't start with impatience. He doesn't start with murder. He doesn't start with, with theft. He doesn't start with lying. He starts with coveting. The wanting. The desire. And what Jesus cuts straight, straight to the point. Worship. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's in worship. It's here in worship where we, we, we refocus our eyes, where we are align our, our sight to desire giving thanks to God, not getting. We realign our, our, our mouths of giving praise to God, of giving honor to God, that in prayer, Jesus taught us to pray in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That it's, it's the holiness, the hallowedness of God that we address in our giving thanks, in giving honor, in giving praise. And coveting? Coveting robs God of thanks. It robs God of praise. It robs God of honor. And it says what we're all about is getting and gaining and grabbing for us. And we've taken even what's highest and even what's best that Jesus has given us. And we've changed it and we've turned it. When Jesus said, first, love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. That people have even taken that and said, well, you know, you can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself first. And we've made even what's good start with our wants and our desires of loving ourselves first. And we never get to that end of that road. And a little better is we, you started with loving our neighbor. Well, that's a good thing. But God's desire is we start with giving our love to God, giving our praise to God, giving our thanks to God, giving our honor to God. That it's in the giving of, of worship, literally means to give worth to, to God that we discover we're not the first. 
and we are not the last. That he is. Jesus' temptation was to get, to gain and to grab rather than to give. It's here in worship we practice giving praise, giving honor, giving thanks, giving heart and soul, mind and strength to God. It's a training, it's a practice that leads us to life full and abundant. How will your life count? You could go for good and miss God altogether. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us uh, eyes that they're focused on you and our, our vision is, is realigned that what we give to you, yes, it's praise because we're seeking ways to give thanks. That what we give to you, it's thanks and honor with our lips, with our hands, with our hearts, with our souls, with our, our mind and all our strength. And Jesus, this day may we give one more thing, and that's our confession, that we too are tempted. Tempted to, to try and be good without your presence, without your leading, without your friendship and without your voice. You died on the cross that we might not just know good, but we might know you. And you forgave. You forgave all those things that we've done and in order to clear the path between us and you that we might be reconciled to you. And you rose from the grave to give us power that heart, soul, mind, and strength we might give to you not just good but our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. Enter into us this time. There may be some things that We've been holding back from giving to you. We may have called a portion of our, ourselves off limits for you. That we're going to deal with it ourselves and we've tried to keep you out of it. It may be that there's a, a secret that we've been coveting. We've been warning and we've tried to keep you out of it. Enter in this day that you might hear our confession and we might know the strength. The scripture says when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just and you forgive us our sins and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we might be led to life. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace, amen.